Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Anata Campbell. Welcome. Hi, Rick. Hi. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. I've been seeing your face on lots of interviews, and I love everything you say. Oh, great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and you've written a book called The Ordinary Buddha, which is based upon or motivated by, I would say, to some extent, the same thing that motivated me to do this show, which is to highlight or you know, sketch out present uh, different ordinary people who've had a spiritual awakening. And um, you go from the well-known, such as Adyashanti and, and Byron Katie, to a lot of people whom no one has ever heard of. Um, but it's a very enjoyable book. I read most of it. Oh, I'm so happy. I, you know, they weren't well-known when I interviewed them. Uh, that's why you were able to get them. Long, long time coming. That's why I was able to get them. Yeah. I was uh, spending time with Byron Katie uh, a lot and mm -hmm. hanging out in uh, Barstow where she was at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did two interviews with her. And then Adi Ashanti uh, had just started. Uh -huh. um, uh, he'd been doing it for a little while, but uh, he was so kind to let me come and my friend came and sat yeah. with him and his wife. It was it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. and beautiful. Yeah, and they're good interviews. I mean, I interviewed Adyashanti, and I've listened to a lot of his stuff, and I learned all kinds of things about them in your interview, that, about him in your interview that I hadn't known. That's so. what I'm hoping. Yeah, yeah. It's personal. And Katie, too. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there that I hadn't known about her, so it's yeah. enjoyable to read. Good. Um, so after all this interviewing and, uh, you know, decades of spiritual pursuit, um, what have you concluded? Ah, there is a conclusion, and, uh -huh. and I only recently came to that. You know, I've been writing this book since 1995, mm -hmm. and my experience was in 93. Uh, so it's a long time coming, and I felt compelled to do this. But just recently, I, I got it, what it's telling me, is that there is no path. There's no one way. Right. There might be a path for you, uh, or there may not be a path. So it's just very unique to each individual. Mm -hmm. And also that every awakening is um, yours, alone and unique. Because nobody experiences awakening in the same way. Mm. From what I've seen and read and heard and since then too. Yeah, I, w I would agree with both of those conclusions myself. Um, I mean, there are some common elements obviously. Uh, exactly. But everybody has a slightly different flavor of it. Slightly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes it's, radically. It's, <laughs> yes, and, and, but it's like, uh, you know, I had, my thing was one angle. Mm -hmm. Somebody else had another angle or side of it. And, you know, like I've heard it said, like the diamond where there's many facets. And, um, you know, I had this facet of seeing clearly truth and reality. And somebody else had this facet. And, and um, so to me, it's fa it's fascinating. <laughs> mm -hmm. hmm. That's the interesting word, facets and fascinating. Yeah. But each one is so unique. But the bottom line is, there's a bottom line for me, what awakening is, which is the realization that you are not who you thought you were. Yeah. You're something else that you had no idea. And there was no way you could ever see it until you did. Mm -hmm. So... So there's that commonality and then the complete, you know, and then the differences, subtle or, or huge or whatever. Yeah. Um, I've heard it said that, you know, we're all kind of like different reflectors and according to our makeup, which could be discussed mm -hmm. in terms of Ayurveda, for instance, or in terms of other models, um, one or another uh, quality of... Uh, the absolute might be predominant so for one person it might be more bliss and for another person more vastness and for another more of a knowingness and and you know and, and uh, obviously all those elements are there but there could be different balances of them according to one's constitution and even in the the whole Vedic thing the the different rishis were said to cognize different aspects of the Veda according to their particular uh, lineage or their shaka, their their particular makeup, and I imagine it could even be sort of analyzed in terms of genetics. But we're all like these little filters, which are kind of, you know, lenses or something, which are all kind of seeing the same thing, but putting a different flavor on it according to our own constitution. Exactly. See, I don't have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I really feel like when I hear you speaking and answering and discussing with people, that I go, yes, 
you know, mm -hmm. yours is the one that I have the biggest yes for. <laughs> so that's exactly the, the my conclusion without knowing these books and mm -hmm. ideas or truths um, is that, yeah, it has to do with, you know, like I'm not, you know, I'm not Gangaji. I like her colors, but I'm <laughs> not her because I'm not one to sit in front of people. I don't have that eloquence. I don't have, you know, I was listening to um, Tripp's uh, Overholt. interview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who's a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. He's awesome. But it was it was great watching. But his thing was, I am as awake as as anybody, you know. And and I agree with that. And then you had your your side. I might be as awake because the awakening where you just lose yourself or know you're not there, you know, it's that's clear and that's the same. But as far as me sitting in front of a group of people and just <laughs> emanating what these people emanate, that's not my personality. Yeah. So that's where I see the difference. Well, we all have different roles to play, you know. I mean, Kabir was a weaver. He just sat and, and spun his loom or whatever it was and wrote this beautiful poetry. Maybe it wasn't his thing to get up in front of hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a hairdresser. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And it's satsang all day long. I mean, Adyashanti was a bicycle mechanic before he yeah. got into being a, you know, a teacher. So, And we go through different phases, too. I mean, five years from now, who knows? He might be sitting up in front of a crowd. You never know. I'm willing wherever uh, it takes me. Yeah. The other thing about what you were saying about the different aspects of uh, awakening based on personality, and then there's, like you say, there's there's the blissful, there's the vastness, there's the emptiness, there's oneness. There's all of these aspects to it. And what I'm finding now, and things have been happening still, uh, you know, it, it's ongoing. Um, it's 20 years since my awakening. Mm -hmm. 20 years until my awakening and 20 years since. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because new things are coming to me. Um, Some people might conclude for, from that that you're only 40 years old. I'll, I'll let them. Just, I'm 42. Yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm 68. I'll, I'll that. Just turned 68. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, long time on this path. And uh, there's so many uh, aspects that I already... Uh, you were saying interrupted was, myself in my no, brain. No, I interrupted you. You were saying it was 20 years uh, in the making and then 20 years yeah. since. So yeah. what's happening is there's, there is this deepening. Mm -hmm. And the deepening, what happened to me just recently was uh, through dreams and this and that happened and different experiences. I realized that my thing was emptiness, no self. That's what Anatta means. And Papaji says, that means I don't exist. And I said, you understand. That's mm -hmm. exactly it. Um, that I just didn't exist. And so there's so much freedom, you know, when you're not there to worry about what anybody thinks of you or you can't worry about anything. There's just nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. So there's that. But then um, recently I realized through the things that happened that I was attached to my emptiness. Mm -hmm. So another identification, like Adi Ashanti said in the book and you probably read, you become attached to your own awakening. Mm. or your identity as an awakened person. And at, at that time when I interviewed him, I think it was 99 or something, um, I, I was getting that. Oh, yeah, I can see. But even now, now I'm attached to the, <clears throat> to the nobody. <laughs> so what I was missing, it started coming in, is presence. Mm -hmm. And that's like new. So oh. here, 20 years later... Here comes the new um, facet of the of the diamond. Well, you know, there were several quotes from your book that I wrote down because I, I they I, I feel so kind of a, strongly about this perspective and the importance of it. And then several of your interviewees stated it very beautifully. For instance, here's one from Adyashanti. He said, "Even now, with me, the mystery is just beginning, always still beginning." And then Jeff said, lately I have been having this feeling that it's just beginning, that my experience is just an opening, a start, a door opening, yet it's a long process to bring that into day-to-day -day life. It's like this thing wants to transform my life, so it goes slowly into different aspects of the personality. And then Ronnie said, although it has been three or four years, I still feel like a baby. And personally... You know, I think this is such an important point because there's a tendency for people to 
hang up their hat at, at so many different stages of the process and conclude that it's done, it's finished, you know, mm -hmm. game is over. And I personally have the attitude that, like Ajisanti said, it's always still beginning. And we don't know how, how <laughs> much wonder and, and uh, you know, richness there is yet to unfold. You know, on the big scale of things, you know, there you know, Ramana Maharshi was just beginning, and who knows what he could grow into. So, so that's why I took issue with Trip a little bit when he said, you know, there's not an inch of daylight between me and Ramana Maharshi. I, I say, on the one hand, yes, uh, there's a level on which that's true. On the other hand, there is a vast range of possibilities for embodiment and enfoldment and infusion of, you know, that uh, absolute value into relative life. That's it, and uh, that's exactly my... See, this is why I knew this was going to be a difficult interview, because I have nothing to disagree with you. Because <laughs> I, I think we're just on the same uh, understanding. And maybe it's a maturity, because when I first had my experiences, which were a couple of them, um, I thought I was done. Mm -hmm. I was so done, you know, because 20 years of looking for something, and then you find it, and here's you open this gift box and it's right there. Why do you don't need anything else? Right. And so I, I literally walked around in that for about eight months. Mm -hmm. And then I went home to visit my parents. <laughs> and then I crashed. <laughs> <laughs> you know that saying by Ram Dass, don't you? If, you? if you think you're enlightened, go spend a week with your parents. <laughs> I know. I know. And, uh, yeah. And, and then trying to, the, what, what brought me down wasn't, my family, actually my dad had passed, but my mom and my siblings, I brought Gangaji videos because I thought, now I'm going to bring this to them, they're going to wake up, it's going to be awesome. And they didn't even, they didn't get it. Right. <laughs> they watched the video, that was, that was generous, mm -hmm. but they didn't get it. And I went, oh no, you know, I can't, I can't share this with the people I really want to share it with. But now here's 20 years later, and I uh, had a conversation with my sister on the phone from New York, and who's uh, Christian, um, although now she does yoga and she's, you know, broadened, but um, we had a satsang on the phone, and I was amazed. It was just amazing. She was ready in to hear it. So it's still ongoing. I don't even know where I started with this. Point, but. Well, we were talking about, um, you know, that it's always still beginning. and that It's all still beginning. And, and there's a kind of an innate human yeah. tendency to sort of want to latch on. You were, saying, you were talking earlier about attachment. There's a, there's a tendency to want to sort of attach to yeah. w w whatever realization has happened and consider that to be final. I don't know why. I mean, there's even a, a strong tendency for people to attach just to the initial understanding of oneness. I, I read this article in What is Enlightenment magazine the other day by this guy that you know was talking about how he was an incorrigible uh, neo advisor fundamentalist during high school uh, <laughs> because you know he had just hypnotized himself with this notion that it's all an illusion and so everything could be brushed off by that notion. You know, global warming, bah, you know, and it's famine, ha, it's all an illusion. Um, and he nearly flunked out of high school and that was his wake up call because he was just so disconnected from the quote unquote real world because he didn't consider it real. And then, you know, he matured out of that. But there's a there's a tendency to get hung up at that level. So and I think there's a ten there's a possibility and it's not uncommon for people to have had a profound, abiding awakening, and yet for some reason to just rest there and perhaps for the rest of this lifetime and not move on. And yet um, moving on is possible. And yeah. you know, maybe next lifetime, whatever. I think that's where uh, uh, life comes in and, and pushes you off, you mm -hmm. know, back into real quote unquote reality that we know isn't. But um, I was I was on that, you know, where it's nothing matters, it's all perfect, and you know it's kind of a nice place to be. Um, and then you kind of then there's a there's a maturing, mm -hmm. and it's like, and I think the maturing is, and and then when I say you know I said I was enlightened because I was, to me that's what I was looking for. Yeah. This thing is it, um, and then. Now I call it an awakening, you know, because enlightenment is a word that means maybe more than that. And and then the deepening happens, and the deepening is the real thing for me, is bringing that, you know, huge understanding, which is almost like naive. Mm -hmm. It's huge, and it's the truth. It's reality. It's the, the reality. 
but now it brings it into, well, why am I on this planet? Yeah. You know, I'm here for something. So I think it's, um, it's bringing, it, having that knowing is incredible and then bringing it into daily life like in alignment. Mm -hmm. And so when you bring that in, um, that's the fullness, you know, of, of awakening or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I'm always hesitant to use the E word myself because mm -hmm. it has this sort of static superlative connotation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I, I like your use of just say an awakening, you know, I mean, and there are many awakenings and some of them are very significant yeah. and, and, you know, certain ones are perhaps irrevocable. Uh, although you never know, but <laughs> in fact, well, for me, the, yeah, the irrevocable is that uh, I know I don't exist, mm -hmm. um, even though a lot of times I think I do. <laughs> in the, it was my second experience, and I was talking to Jeff on the phone, who you mentioned earlier, at late at night, and right. um, so I'll just tell you about this one because it was the second one. Um, I was completely, um, I was gone. But I didn't go anywhere um, because I never had been there. Mm -hmm. So it was the recognition that I never was there. And even though I thought I was, I knew it just, there was nobody there. There was an energy moving through my body that I saw, literally. And the body was there, but there was no me, no personality, no you know structure like that. And then I knew immediately that if I ever thought that I was there, it wouldn't be true. So that's how I live my life. I, I think I'm there, but I know, it, I know it's not. It's just not true. So it's it's so interesting. And so, you know, like we're talking about the continuing, and it goes on and on and on. Um, so now, 20 years later, I'm getting um, this presence thing, mm -hmm. which I didn't even know what it was. And I talked to I have a I go to a Buddhist uh, hermitage, and I talked to him, and I said I don't know what's going on, but this thing keeps coming in and he says well do you want to talk more or do you want to talk less and I said well less so he said oh okay that's good <laughs> but I didn't know what it was and then other things I had a dream and I started realizing it's it's the 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 opposite of the emptiness which is what I love so much the emptiness I love the desert I love empty you know and now it's this other thing coming in and knocking on the door and um, its presence, which mm -hmm. I have other friends who, a friend who's writing a book on presence, and you know, and and that's what it's just. I don't know if it's more joyful because I can't, you know, you can't compare children, you know, <laughs> who you love more, but um, it's it's more joy coming in. Yeah, filling me. It's like filling the emptiness with. No thingness. It's nothing either. But it's it's more. There's a richness that's coming in now, and and I just my whole expression. I can feel it change. It's like what what is this? What is this? Mm -hmm. So like um, even I, I remember Adi Shanti saying, "What what is this? That what is it that I, I'm looking for? What is it that keeps wanting me to find it? You know, what is this? Move." <laughs> in Sanskrit, there are these two phrases which are juxtaposed. Uh, Shunyavada and Purnavada. And Shunyavada is fullness of emptiness. Purnavada is fullness of fullness. And they talk, you know, that there's that saying, you know, um, how's it go? I forget the Sanskrit, but, you know, that is full, this is full, taking fullness from fullness, fullness remains. It, um, oh, geez, I'll remember the Sanskrit later. It's a real famous mm -hmm. one. But in any case, um, I think these are representative of probably, in your, and, and it seems to be in your experience, of phases or stages. Yeah. You know, and first one tastes the emptiness quality, and then it begins to get full, you know. Mm. Shunyavada, is that what you said? Shunyavada, V-A-D-A. Um, Shunyavada. Yeah. I like that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> yeah, except you're That's you're moving into the Purnavada yeah. phase, which means but it's full. The fullness, fullness of emptiness is more what, uh, what I would describe as my, hmm. you know, me. <laughs> yeah. Huh, interesting. That's my, my angle on it. What, you know, like you say, well, however you come into the planet with whatever you have, that feels like my, mm -hmm. my bag. Because it's, it's full. It's a full emptiness, yeah. Love it. Shunya Vada. Vada. Yeah. Um, one thing I thought of while you were talking that I find helpful is uh, to sort of think of us ourselves as multidimensional.
Mm-hmm. You know, you said, okay, you're having this conversation with Jeff, and you realize you were nobody, you were nothing, you were, you know, there was nobody there, no personality. Um, and yet, you know, we could argue that on some level, you still are somebody. You know, you were there was a there's somebody talking to Jeff. That pers- that there was certain per- personality characteristics that were different than Jeff's, uh, and all and so on. Mm-hmm. And I kind of find that it's in the. I, I don't mean to sound pedantic, but there's this uh, there's this another Sanskrit word called mithya, which is dependent reality, and they use the example of a pot. So you have a pot, and there really is no pot. It's only clay, you know. But there's mm-hmm. the appearance of a pot, and the appearance of a pot does pot things. You know, you can put stuff mm-hmm. in it or use it as a drum or something. So you know. We ha- and you know physics comes to the rescue. They'll tell you that you know there is actually no gravity at a certain level of of nature's functioning. All, all the forces and laws and whatnot that we see governing the universe sort of are not to be found if you go deep enough. And yet you know uh, at various strata uh, apparent levels of of reality, they're very much real. If you don't think they are, go try jumping off a building. Um, you know, so it's kind of like a both and way of looking yeah. at it where. You know, I have no trouble saying, yeah, absolutely, there is no one there, and yet, at the same time, there is, and mm-hmm. as paradoxical as those two things may be, they can get along quite well. Well, that's true and for me now. Yeah. Um, and that's what I, having had that experience, um, I know that's true, absolutely. It's the biggest truth, and then I also know this is true, and I'm here, like, to play mm-hmm. and to do whatever, um, but in that moment... I really, there was nothing in that moment. Right. There was well, nothing. Even though it was talking, there was nobody talking. And, and I said to Jeff on the phone, I said, well, you're not here. Your electrical impulse is on a phone. Mm-hmm. You don't exist. I don't exist. And literally, I didn't know if I would be uh, dead in the morning. Right. I just laid back down. But I already, before I even lay down, I brought myself back. Mm-hmm. I did that on purpose, Got, uh, Katie says, because I said, what was that? She said, and you didn't have to, she said. I didn't have to think myself because I was raising a, a child. How am I going to do that? Yeah. Um, but now, it's now, you know, the knowings that I have, this is the thing that never goes away, that um, never changes. The self I thought I was, in my first experience, I understood that just not true. And the second experience, even that isn't, there's nothing, you know. Um, but I live a really full, 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 full life. I am so busy. I do so many things, and mm-hmm. um, and I'm raising. I raised two extra children after mine were grown, who I'm not related to, and that's it. Just came to me, and it's what I had to do, and not even what I had to do, but it was my privilege. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, you know, I think I live a much bigger life. I am more expanded and um, free and um, fearless than I ever would have been if I thought I was a self. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I live, I live more, looks like a bigger life, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. there's, there's less inside, and that's what's been happening lately. More, there's a more, even lately again, or, yeah, it's like again, because I think maybe it's waves, because I kind of, yeah, I was pretty much of a personality there for a while, and, you know, mm-hmm. I went through a lot of stuff. And, but lately it just feels more uh, spacious, and there's just this little piece of an anatta, is you know and I had this dream and I didn't know I was saying earlier I had a dream and I couldn't remember my name hmm. what am I called now I was Garimo Osho gave me the name Garimo mm-hmm. and then before that I was Patricia and in my dream I remembered those two but I couldn't remember what I've been called for the last 15 years <laughs> huh. and uh, could not remember and I woke up I still couldn't remember I was awake I couldn't remember what I'm called and, and that was coming out of some experiences that I had been having about an attachment to this uh, anatta, which means I don't exist, no self. I was attached to that, like as an identity. So I think it was a gift. And, and, in the, and I'm trying to remember, trying to remember, and I thought, I think it starts with an S. I couldn't remember. Shunya. So then somebody told me Shunya yeah. means zero. I said, I think yeah. I just need a big zero. <laughs> and he said, Shunya. I went, oh, there's my S. So uh. how I remembered my name was to visualize. I said, okay, I have a sign at work. I know it's my hair salon and it has my name on it. Let me see what it says. So in my mind's eye, I went and looked. And it says, 
Anata Hair Studio. <laughs> mm. So I went, that's the only way I could remember my name. This was fully awake. Hmm. So uh, I love that experience because now I feel like there's just more of a, you know, and I look inside, I don't see that in there now as an identity. It's weird. I mean, and it's like um, almost like esoteric and it's a story and all of that, but it's, uh, it's a good one and it's fun for me, you know. So I just look inside now, I feel much more of a space, mm -hmm. which actually connects me more with the moment because there's not so much filter in the way, there's not a, so much veil and, and um, you know. I just recently spent a weekend with my mom and my niece and her three kids and the cat and it was, it was blissful. It was just blissful going shopping or being with the kids and there's just less me to be in the way to want something else, I think, mm. you know. There's nothing to want anything other than the perfection. Yeah. There's so many, so many interesting thoughts that, that stimulates. Uh, I was just talking with a friend yesterday and he was saying, we were kind of agreeing that we had both gone through a period of years where you just felt like, you know, get me out of here. I, I don't, you know, I want to get liberated. I don't want to reincarnate. I just, you know, life is suffering. And then somehow or other the whole thing turned around at a certain point and now it's like, I don't care how long this goes on. This is fun. You <laughs> this, know? Is fun. this is fun. I think there's something from the Course in Miracles that somebody's always posting these things which I love because they're really true. In, in what they say, but it's like being there, you know, dead, floating with God, or being fully enlightened and not in the world isn't better than being present. Mm -hmm. It's like we're here, it's not better to be dead and in heaven with God, you know. <laughs> it's, and, you know, and I read a lot of stories of people who have died and have gone, and it's incredibly blissful. But this is heaven, you know, when you're present to it and you're not trying to get away. <laughs> Yeah. It's also, both. They're both good. It's where you are is the best place to be. Also, when we speak of you know people who have died and gone to heaven and all that, we're speaking from an individual perspective. I mean, yeah. if we if we zoom back a little bit, you know, and and kind of remember that we are that cosmic intelligence which yeah. in which the yeah. whole universe is contained and of which uh, this individual expression that we somehow identify with is just a, one little tiny tendril among trillions of tendrils that are you know kind of experiencing then you know and that's really who we are i mean we're not just emptiness or silence or nothingness we, we are kind of an ocean of intelligence that is self-referral and that you know by interacting with itself creates this wondrous universe uh you know then it kind of i don't know puts things in perspective for me and it, it sort of also gives you a sense of how profound the journey can continue to become, um, you know, growing into the experiential living of that rather than just the kind of conceptual entertainment of it. Yeah, that's what it feels like is, is happening. And, you know, I like what you said before, who knows where it's going? Mm -hmm. You know, this this whole thing of this, this presence knocking, you know, it's like, what is that? You know, it's just new. It's new. Yeah. And it's... Um, um, you know, it's it's not not ordinary. It's it's I don't know. It's who knows what's gonna come up. But it's not even to look for that. It's not even to I want bigger and better. You know, this is pretty great. I mean, I look out there and I have, you know, white squirrels out there <laughs> because we live in the area that have them. Mm. There's a squirrel hanging off my bird feeder right now. It just doesn't get better than this. Mm -hmm. And and yet we'll see. Yeah. I'm open to whatever. You know. <laughs> There's I have that, nothing but an openness you know, at this point. There's that beer ad where two guys are sitting in a boat fishing and one of them is, and drinking beer, and one of them says, it doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that, and I'm like, right. <laughs> Give me that beer. You know, what you were saying before, we were talking about uh, near-death experiences, and, and I do read that because um, they're similar mm -hmm. to awakenings. They're very similar. It's the same understanding. When they come back from that, and, and we come back from our awakening experience we it's you live life differently you're changed and um yeah somebody asked well what what do you get out of this my sister when i was talking to her in new york what well what good is it to be awake well there's a list and actually there's a list and i i had this book that i this is from like 99 i gave mm -hmm. this to my daughter the ordinary buddha this is like an early <laughs> manuscript yeah and uh December 20th, 1999, and Adi Shanti wasn't even in it yet, so I interviewed him after that. 
Here's a good little poem on the cover, though. These are some things that are not in my book now that I want to put back in. Mm -hmm. John has some poems in my book. It just goes by John. And, and, and the first, uh, on the first page, I put, I am just a container, empty inside, and a suspicion is dawning that only the space is truly alive. Hmm. I thought, that's nice. a good one. You know uh, how you were talking a few minutes ago about how full your life is and how busy yeah. you are and how much you're doing and all that yeah. stuff. <laughs> I, I was kind of reminded of an analogy, and maybe you can tell this to your sister in answer to the question, okay. uh, you know, what good is it to be awake? And, and that is that, you know, a shallow pond can only rise up in little ripples. It can't really rise up in very big waves, but an ocean, a deep ocean, can rise up in huge tidal waves. So, so awakening is kind of like recognizing one's oceanhood, and it, and it bestows the capacity to, you know, live life with much greater sort of richness and fullness and and, and enth even enthusiasm yeah. than than if we're constricted to narrow awareness. Yeah. I used to, uh, before awakening and then after awakening, um, and I still had this tendency a little bit after, but I would get very depressed at times. Mm -hmm. And I would just, not clinical because it would go away, you know, but I would go to bed and pull the cover over my head and not want to move. And just you know disappear, and you know it's kind of good because I did disappear, you know, in a way. But I used to really have that a lot, and then afterwards, you know, that was you know I, it would creep in a little bit, but it would just it would just leave because it wasn't sort of needed. But um, you know, the thing about releasing my book now after all these years, I wasn't ready. Um, I think, you know, I, I was trying to get it released and wasn't happening and all this stuff. But I think that my ego was still present, you know, sort of too much. I didn't want to be exposed. So it's really interesting about the bigness and fullness and deepness and all of that that allows you to be and do. Because now I don't care if you think I'm an egoist because I'm saying that I had an awakening or I'm telling you my experiences because I don't care. It doesn't matter. There's not enough there to care. Mm -hmm. what you think, even if you think, you know, and, and so I just think there was, um, um, that was part of the maturing, you know, that finally this book came out, now it's like, it, it is what it is, this is just what happened. But there, there are a whole bunch of things that I, that I have in this old book that I don't have now. The first response is tremendous relief, the search is over. That was huge for me, it was just like, yay, and such <laughs> a celebration, you know. We have discovered our true nature. I'm going to read it all, but freedom from the small self, the detachment from the ego. It's just this freedom of, of not worrying about what that's doing as much. And I used to want to, in the beginning, I used to want that to go away, you know, because I had this other. It was a Buddha is what I saw in my first experience. It was the Buddha, me the Buddha. And what I got from that was you're the Buddha and there isn't anybody that isn't. So I recognize that the energy of the Buddha, the peace and the contentment and the the freedom, the beauty, that's everybody. So that's what everybody gets when they get awake. They get that, you know, that download, like Adi Ashanti said, of insights. Mm -hmm. um, but I still, then there was this personality. It's like, well, just get away from me, you know. It was <laughs> just annoying. But now it's like, oh, well, I don't even care about it. It's still there. You know, we'll just um, love it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And then there's the the search is over, so there's a freedom there, a sense of peace, a sense of trust, tendency to act spontaneously. So that's huge. It's like whatever comes to me, like Adi Ashanti said, what, somebody said, what? how do I know what to do? He said the next obvious thing. Ah, you I know, love I love that too. And in fact, uh, there's a book I was going to mention earlier by Suzanne Siegel um, called Collision with the Infinite. And the, you read that? Have you? Yeah. So that's one of her catchphrases. And uh, ah. uh, and the reason I was going to mention it is you're talking about sort of the realization of emptiness. And in her case, it was so sudden and unexpected uh, that it, it induced great fear because she kept looking for herself. I and, was afraid too. Yeah, couldn't find one. It no, when I disappeared, I didn't know if I was going to die. It wasn't yeah, a like good you experience. Said, yeah, right. But afterward it was. When you adjust a bit. Yeah, afterward it was like, oh, it's freedom. But yeah. it was scary, yeah. <laughs> and in her case, she went on for 10 years until she got with John Klein, Jean Klein, and he kind of, who was Francis Lucille's yeah. teacher, and he sort of made her realize that, hey, this is a good thing. <laughs> Just relax. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Stop, stop looking for a, a self, you know. Yeah, yeah, because <clears throat> it's clinical. I mean, it's it's a psychosis mm -hmm. to not know who you are, and you know, people go to mental hospitals for that when they disconnect with, you know. But that's not what we're really talking about. There's a couple of acceptance of all life's good and bad, gratitude, enjoyment, and love. Those are those are things. And and in, what I don't see in here is uh, creativity. Mm. You open up to so much more creativity. I didn't. Ha I wasn't creative before this, and then afterwards, I was. Yeah. Well, I, look at the universe again. You know, yeah. look at look at a single cell. And and look at how much intelligence and creativity and you know, or a plant or a bird or anything uh, is is goes into you know forming that expression, and you know if that's the, if that if that source of all all life and all you know creation is also what we are you know mm -hmm. which I think intuitively know, we know it is then think how much creativity is there think mm -hmm. how much intelligence is there. Uh, you know, and to what extent can we be a channel for that, a reflector of that? Um, the, the possibilities are endless. And when you mention bliss, you know, that's another character. You know, Sat Chit Ananda, that's one of the characteristics of that. And so if a person is feeling depressed, maybe there's just some blockage that's preventing the bliss from flowing. Because if the, you know, there should be no room for depression if the bliss is unob unobstructed, mm -hmm. the flow of it. Yeah, and that, these are all things that, you know, have like, with the maturing or deepening process have grown and mm -hmm. become more and more. And will continue to grow. Will continue. But I went through a really difficult uh, time. I have, like I said, these two children. They're the grandchildren of the man I was living with. Mm -hmm. But that relationship wasn't going well, <laughs> mm -hmm. even, you know. And, um, and it was really hard, you know, and, and we ended it, which was a good thing. But... Um, <clears throat> Um, you know, there was, I, I remember just being so down, you know, and, and still the bliss is there and I know it. And this is years later after all these experiences, but, you know, there's the, an alignment. This is Adi Shanti. I did a, a group with him early on, which was called um, Embodiment, Embodiment Group he did early on. Uh, so people who came already had had these experiences and now you want to embody it. And, and that's what really um, goes on. And I, that's why I think life, you know, kicks your butt and throws these things in, like this relationship, which was, it was good. And I got these two children to raise. So mm -hmm. it was perfect for um, karma for me and them. And, and uh, you know, it, it was good. But um, it's interesting that I could still be in, you know, this is hard, you know, it was sure. hard. Um, but I never lost myself, you know, you know, it, it's always there. But you have to, so getting rid of that relationship was a way to bring me back into alignment, you know, that was off. Mm -hmm. And I knew it was off and I did it anyway. So it's like, you kind of know, I mean, I think after you wake up or even probably before, you know, we all know what's right and when we don't do it, it's, we're off, off center, off kilter and, and we don't feel good. So even now, uh, and I went to, um, so Brian, who just you interviewed, um, starts with a P, Peregrossi, I don't know how Oh, Brian Peregrossi, yeah. Peregrossi. Uh, I picked up the equipment from him because he's in Asheville. And he right. was the last interview, which was mm -hmm. really fun. And I had wanted to go to one of his meetings. But one of the persons there, it was a beautiful um, meeting with him. And young mm -hmm. people, just mm -hmm. beautiful young people and some older, but... Um, here's these kids that I was in India with in 1980. Here they are again. You know, the same kids they look like. And they're, sa they're, just, they're just beautiful. But um, one of them was, was talking about uh, addiction and how you can be awake, but if you're in your addiction, you know, you're not going to be... They didn't even use the word awake, but you can be really good and all this wonderful stuff happening, but then you have this addiction, which is taking you away. And I, I relate to that because even for me, it's food. Mm -hmm. So it's sugar and, uh, you know, the white stuff and, and all of that. And if I am really let myself be in that, I lose my alignment. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. So we can still be as awake and like Tripp says, not, not a, a breath of air between me and uh, anybody. But at the same time, if I'm in my addiction, I sure don't feel that way. You know? Yeah.
And, well, and the so Sargadado was apparently addicted to nicotine, you know, and it killed him. Yeah. And, so, you know, and pa Papaji, and I was with Osho and with Papaji, mm -hmm. uh, they were both diabetic. It's right. sugar. <laughs> they said that Osho, I heard, could eat 20 apples a day. They had to keep him from eating 20 apples a day. And and uh, I know Adi Ashanti, uh, I mean, uh, Papaji, ate candy because he fed us candy from this sure. restaurant, which I ate when I was there. <laughs> if he's giving me candy, I'm going to eat it. But, uh, you know, they, they still have that. But for me, it's like I have to, if I want to stay really free and stay awake, um, I have to watch how I live, mm -hmm. what I put into my body, who I associate with even, and, you know, and bring your alignment back into um, the wholeness and the happiness that you know. And, you know, like I said, I think whether you had an awakening experience or not, you know what's right for you. And it's important to live what you know is right and have the courage to do that. Well, I think if you listen to it, the, you know, the, the kind of the inner barometer or whatever yeah. uh, becomes more and more sensitive and, and you get more intuitive. And there, there's a, you know, the, the discriminating faculty is not alien to enlightenment. In fact, it's, uh, I think, instrumental in bringing it about. And you know you can you can begin to trust your intuitions more. And in fact, there's there's a Sanskrit phrase called Ritambara Pragya, and it's that that level of intellect which knows only truth. Mm -hmm. And it's said that if you're kind of operating from that level, then you can you know clearly r r discriminate between anything and rec recognize. Uh, you know, and, and even to know to experience something. I mean, you can sort of take the thought of an apple on you know the mental level and, and experience the apple in its fullness, even though there is no actual apple. Right. Although perhaps you know, extrapolating you know beyond that, that could be res the instrumental in how people can manifest apples or you know <laughs> loaves and fishes or or whatever if they've got that developed to a great enough extent. I believe in miracles. Sure. You know, I mean, I think there's some things about uh, this awakening and all of that where Osho used to call it esoteric bullshit mm -hmm. because he couldn't say S-H. <laughs> esoteric bullshit. <laughs> and, and so I, you know, wasn't, I'm not, I'm not a new age kind of person because mm -hmm. I'm not into all of that. And yet, you know, and yet I've had experiences that, that are those that people talk about. So I don't discount anything, you know. <laughs> Everything is possible. Jet planes are miracles, you know. Go well, back, go back 150 years, and then have a jet plane fly over and see yeah. how people would react. How um, am I talking to you right now? And yeah, saying, right, exactly. Radio was a miracle. I mean, I, yeah. I was walking around one day years and years ago, and and I just went, "Oh my God, television! How is that?" I I all of a sudden was like in the 1800s, and I was mm -hmm. looking at it from a, the, that perspective and looking at the world and just. How this is all a miracle? So-called miracles no, are no. they're just utilization <laughs> of laws of nature which are not very well known. So we call them miracles. If, right. if it's if it's possible to walk on water, then there must be certain laws of nature which, if one could master them, would enable one to do that. Yeah, we'll uh, see. And you know, we'll see. But you know, obviously, it's something very rare, and so we call it a miracle. If we lived in a society in which everyone had that kind of mastery, then it would be like, oh, yeah, so what, you know? <laughs> exactly. But, you know, for me, I was talking to a lady who had, you know, when I said when I'm doing hair, it's like satsang uh, often. Mm -hmm. um, because somebody will ask something, and I'll say something, and then they'll answer. And then it's like, I say there's a new, there's a new coming, out, coming out of the closet thing. Mm -hmm. It used to be, well, if you're gay, you know, you didn't let people know. Now you come out of the closet, and you can be a little proud of that and whatever. But... Um, now it's like, oh, I've had those experiences. Don't mm. tell anybody. <laughs> right. You know, but I'm going to just tell you. So it's like they're coming out with these amazing things that have happened that just hasn't been discussed. It's, it's a whole new coming out of the closet. But um, this lady was talking about her dog died. Mm -hmm. And she came back to her mm -hmm. at a time when she needed her. And she was there, and there was the golden fur. and. And uh, it was a beautiful experience for her, and she helped her with another dog that was sick, that she couldn't get <clears throat> to uh, take his eardrops. Mm -hmm. So, and she just couldn't. It was a 150-pound dog, and all of this stuff. And and then um, she uh, said, then the dog said, "I'll help you." You know, came to her and said, "I'll help you." 
And she's like, okay. So the next time she went to do dog dog, lay down on the floor, and I thought to myself, the dog was sitting on him. And that's what she said. I get chills. Uh. <laughs> that's what she said. She said, I asked her. She said, I was sitting on him. Hmm. So uh, that's why he laid down <laughs> and she put the eardrops. But, you know, that's just one thing that she doesn't tell anybody but me. You know, yeah. nobody's going to... Because people are going to think they're weird or something. Yeah, but yeah. for me, so, I was, so my experience was one of, um, you know, a, a woo-woo kind of experience of seeing my dad who had died when he was 54. Mm-hmm. And I went into a meditation because somebody else, because like I say, I'm not new agey, but I went to this meditation and she was looking at who the, what are the spirits are around us. And I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. So I went home and I, I started looking and I, I looked for Osho and he was there. You know, I could mm. feel it. But then my dad came in mm. and it was him. It was truly him because um, for one thing, there was a fragrance that I realized I always knew was his. But when we're in this plane, we have, we have an actual smell and vision and all these things get in the way of the essence. So there was like a flavor, a fragrance that I knew it was him. And then I said, well, now you're going to be sorry. Now you're going to apologize for all the times you smacked me or did, you know, he's Italian, you know, and yeah. he never beat me or anything, but just all the things I was mad at, you know. And um, he said, no. I've ne- I've, and he didn't say it in words. It's like so, it's like, you know, it's the thing because it's not words it's not imagination it's there's a fragrance there and then instead of apologizing like i said now he's with god he's going to apologize because he knows he's on the other side he knows what he did wrong he said i did it perfectly Mm. i played my role perfectly and i was shocked i couldn't have made that up Mm -hmm. you know how would i i don't believe that you know so that was so huge for me because number one, it showed me there are other things other than you know what what is that uh, Shakespearean thing? Oh yes, yeah, so there's there's Earth more in this heaven right than than is contained in all your philosophies. Yeah, yeah. or imagination or anything else. Right. So uh, yeah, that one that came to me, but um, so now I knew there was more, and 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 I don't know if he's there or what that was, but I know that I got a message. And um, and it was his fragrance that was huge, but the other thing is I can't do it wrong. Now, mm-hmm. I can't do it wrong, and I've done a lot of things that I shouldn't have done. I don't think you know, or acted as. But um, now I just from that I just felt like well, none of us can do it wrong. Hmm. So I mean I I was thinking about this interview. It's like um, well people don't go there you know with these things in this. Um, to, you mean to, to new a age stuff? Dual thing. Oh. Yeah, but but there's also there's just more things in heaven and earth. To oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, a lot of my interviews have been pretty yoga booga, you know. I mean, oh, have they? <laughs> yeah. Um, I miss those. I'm well, Anita, real... Anita Morjani, for one thing. I mean, she's a well-known near-death experience person, so that there's that. And, uh, yeah. and um, there have been a number of others, just because, you know, I kind of have this attitude that it's... Uh, you know, like you say, there there are more things in heaven and earth ratio than are contained in all your philosophies. There's, there's, I mean, and I think the reason you and I both probably um, are a little leery of the new age scene is, which is, seems a little passe now. I mean, it's been a while since that, yeah. <laughs> but it's still there though. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe especially in Asheville, is is that if that becomes one's predominant focus, one can get lost oh. in all in all this kind of yeah. you know extraneous stuff. Yeah. Which is ultimately not, you know, the the ground state that we're looking for, and so, you know, but if if that ground state has been established, then perhaps there's a, a little bit of freedom to explore some of these things without getting lost in them. And, and you know, Margio always used to use the analogy of capturing a fort. He says that it's like a territory, and there's all these mines around the territory, gold and silver and diamond. And you know, if you go after exploring those mines, but you haven't first captured the fort then the territory doesn't belong to you and you're just going to be wasting your time going after one little thing as opposed to owning the whole territory and you could also just get lost endlessly in this yeah. that and the other thing without really you know getting to the goal that's that's a great analogy i love that yeah. but i actually did i i did a few talks um on my bike i just hit it you're okay <laughs> um uh, Could, about my book mm-hmm. and uh you know i really wanted to get into Awakening, you know, what is it for you, and that you are the ordinary Buddha, and how to discover that, and 
and but there were some people who were just in you know in the new agey realm and really took it like off topic you know for me right and took it into well we're going to go and we're going to do this thing and then we're going to change the weather because there's a storm coming you yeah. know and, and it's like no we're not <laughs> you, know? <laughs> right. you know the point for me is there's a storm coming yay yeah you know? get it, get out the skis and and i i'm with uh, katie who says i don't argue with god right you know because i'm always going to lose and she says haven't you noticed Right. You're always going to lose, haven't you noticed? And I have noticed. (laughs) And I don't argue with God. I don't want to argue with God. I don't want to make it different. You know, I want to celebrate this and, and, you know, right here, right now. Yeah. And, you know, there's that alcoholics pledge of, of, or that saying of, you know, changing the things you can change, not not changing the things you can't, and having the wisdom to know the difference. So, you know, I'll get down to the real nitty gritty, and we are God. We well, are that. We yeah, are that, and, and so we, we have a certain latitude to, uh, ac- you know, a certain freedom yeah. to exercise influence, but only to a certain extent. You know, that's my favorite prayer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, mm-hmm. uh, and change the things I can, and that's that's where you know what that's such a great prayer because it brings the absolute and the relative together, and it brings it into alignment because on this yeah. planet. You know, raising the kids I'm raising, I can change something mm-hmm. there. I can do something, you know. And um, not to say, oh, well, it's, it's all nothing and they'll, you know, it's all in God's hands. It's, it's not, yeah, we are yeah. God. And we've seen people go level, to either extreme, you know. The weather, I just like, why, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then either, po- either pole, you can see, you know, some people, I have to control everything. And they're, they're like, you know, practically, ex- their heads are exploding. They're trying so hard to control everything. Mm-hmm. And the other extreme, you see people, like you just said, eh, you know, you can't do anything. There's no one to do it. Everything happens all by itself. There's, there's a kind of a balance point between those things. I think I'm I'm pretty balanced now because yeah, I've, yeah. I've had both of those. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've had both of those trying to control everything till my head explodes. You can ask my friends and family. Mm-hmm. You know, I have really done that, and then and the other just completely, you know, surrendered. So, but that's the balance, and that's the alignment, and that's I think the the um, you know, that's the play. Somebody said we're here to play this. You know, we're here to play and to celebrate. Um, rediscovering that we're God and and um, uh, you know and then and being on the earth as well and fully present here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and as God, having you know rediscovered that to whatever extent we have, uh, you know, God obviously is orchestrating things, mm-hmm. and in a certain small sphere, He can orchestrate things through us. You know, within yeah. our within our yeah. capacities, we just have to know what we can orchestrate and what is not meant for us to orchestrate. Well, I think that's the you know the Adi Shanti thing. The next obvious thing yeah. is um, it's to say yes, mm-hmm. and that's what what I've done. You know, the last bunch of years is just I just say yes, and and it leads you somewhere, and you are creating and you know you are doing, but you're saying yes to what's obvious to do. Yeah. It's not fighting anymore. There's no, there's no, I don't really have a fight in me at which way to go or how to do anything. It's just it's obvious. But I'm sure you can be decisive. Uh, you know, if, yeah. if, you, if this oh, one, of yeah. these, one of these kids you're raising says, hey, I think I'll become a meth addict, you know, you're probably going to intervene in some way. <laughs> Believe me, I can be loudly decisive. <laughs> Very loudly, yeah. They've yeah. heard it. But you know what's nice is, um, yeah, it's come around, I mean, lately to just a nice uh, place where I don't have to be as loud. <laughs> but no, I, no, it's being fully in the world, doing everything we do. I mean, if you're, you know, I, I asked uh, uh, Gangaji about my daughter at the time. I was raising a teenager then as well. And um, I said, how do I, now what do I do? You know, because now that I know it's all perfect and I'm all awake and all that. And, and, and she, she said, um, Maybe this was even answered to somebody else. She said, "You'll you'll hug her or you'll shake her. Mm. You'll know what to do. You'll hug her or you'll shake her." And that really hit me. I, I don't know if I would shake her, but I don't know. <laughs> but um, metaphorically I, I speaking, I use bad yeah. words. I use bad words, and that really gets their attention. You mm. know, <laughs> like, when it's up to here, and I was like, "You're pushing it." But, uh, <laughs> mm. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then she said, and the rest, and I said, you know, but she's growing her ego now. How does that work? 
-hmm. and the girl I'm raising now. She's growing her ego. You have to get that fully developed. And, and I noticed, I know when my ego was grown enough to let it go. I remember things that happened to me that I needed to feel full and, and whole and uh, like accomplished, you know, in the world mm. first. So, but she said, and the rest she'll get from you. And when she said the rest she'll get from you, that was my acknowledgement because I had had my experience like the day before uh, I saw her. And, mm. and I knew, okay, I have it to give, to share. Interesting. That was the, that was the implanting in me and, and the, yeah, this is it. Yeah, this interesting theme about growing the ego versus diminishing it. I remember talking to somebody recently in one of the interviews about you know how gurus might serve at sometimes the role of humbling you yes. and, and at other times the role of emboldening you you know and giving giving you confidence and uh so it, it's, it's it's funny i i can't <laughs> make a simplistic uh, analysis of it but it seems that both things are mm -hmm. needed perhaps at different times perhaps even at the same time in certain ways that was osho for me oh, the humbling both the, the emboldening yeah, both. both okay yeah, both. yeah. um the humbling was one day when I was walking around living at the ranch in Oregon and and uh, he had just given a talk on um, motherhood and how it's just bullshit basically <laughs> <laughs> and I was like what you know that's my identity mm -hmm. uh, so that wiped that one out and I remember going around there just just in a daze hmm. you know you're just throwing me off this motherhood thing and and uh, you know, after that identity, I could let that go. I, had, I was a much better mother, <laughs> hmm. you know, a much better mother than having an identity. I'm the mother. Hmm. But then, so that was, the, you know, some of those things. There were other things, too. He would just flop you, you know. Hmm. But then uh, when I said this thing about lifting me was when I uh, worked in the, um, in the ashram in India as a massage therapist. And you wore black robes, and everybody else wore maroon and and so the black robed people were the you know the the higher ups kind of you know the more the higher thought of i kind of needed that mm -hmm. so when i did that and i was more respected it kind of gave me a respect i needed since childhood when i didn't mm -hmm. feel respected i think i needed that that wholeness so whatever you accomplish in your career whatever and and i was a good massage therapist and, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I got acknowledged. And, and that, I really felt like that was like, okay, you know, that was the thing that I needed to fill mm -hmm. a hole that was, you know, missing that. So, yeah, I got both of those. He was a good, he was a good guru for me. Hmm. Good master. Hey, on that note, um, let's, let's retrace your steps a little bit. People like to hear the story of what a person has gone through in addition to hearing whatever philosophical insights they may have to offer. Yeah. And, uh, I like it. It, it was I a get, good story. Yeah, I get feedback from people if I don't include that in interviews. Sure. So let's kind of start at the beginning and take us through what you consider yeah. the significant and interesting phases of your journey. There have been a lot of them. Um, I was like a Jesus freak. Mm -hmm. in the Catholic Church mm. and I was uh, married to a man that I shouldn't have been <laughs> after the years that it just wasn't working and um, of course it, it was perfect but it uh, was you perfect know. <laughs> I've been divorced a lot I'll just say that yeah. but uh, I've been single for years and years and years now but um, uh, I was a Jesus freak I was in church like like in tears over my love for for Jesus who mm -hmm. I see was just my first guru mm -hmm. Then, um, uh, and yet I knew I needed to get divorced, so then that took me out of the church. <laughs> yeah. But then uh, I was um, <clears throat> reading a book by Osho, and it said, you have missed in many lifetimes. And the vision I had was of being with Jesus in a lifetime and being in the back of the crowd, and he said, follow me, and I, I didn't. Mm. And I said, I'm not going to miss I'm not going to miss in this lifetime. So and, a Jesus freak ended up reading a, an Osho book because she had been ostracized from the church. And no, would, no, uh, not quite. I was a seeker since I was a teenager. Uh -huh. I, I used to want to be a nun, and then I found out boys were more fun. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I didn't become a nun. I was always looking for God. I really feel that. From young, you know, young. I was in love with the saints who were children and all of that, and... So when you say you were a Jesus freak, do you mean you were a fundamentalist and everybody's going to hell except for... No, no. Know, oh, my gosh, no. Not that thing. You just are an ardent devotee of Jesus. 
uh, I was in love with with his uh, awakened you know self. Right. And and uh, oh, none of that. And when I was eight years old, and they told me you sh- you can't associate with literally somebody said from the church you can't associate with divorced people. I had an aunt who was divorced. I said, oh no. I was like eight years old or seven. Mm-hmm. I said no, that's wrong. Good. I never bought into anything. I always had an open heart, I think, and I kind of got what was real and true. So I was looking for a real truth. So anyway, then I found Osho because I was a seeker. Um, I was uh, looking. I was reading about Easter Island. I was reading mm. these books. I was doing aku, yoga. Aku. I had a, a yoga uh, teacher from India that would come and, um, you know, and I would go to, I would do all, all these things seeking. Um, and I was married and I had children. And I was still, I was like a hippie, but in a, in a kind of a more, you know, I didn't do drugs, you know, in that kind of, not that way. But uh, anyway, I found this book that said, you know, you've missed. And I said, I'm not going to miss. I'm going to follow this man. So I did. And, and I wound up, uh, I saw uh, meetings with remarkable men one time, that wonderful movie about uh, Gurdjieff. And I, I said, I have to go to India. And that was it. I went to India. And me, uh, uh, you know, a housewife with kids, what am I going to India for? I, I had to go. I was so compelled. This this path has been dragging me, you know, like I, there's no way I couldn't do it. I couldn't. I went to India. I had kids. I shouldn't have left my kids, and I did. And I was with Osho there. I went many times to, with him. Um, um, and he knocked off, like I said, knocked off attachments and identifications, you know, right and left. It was It was a great experience. It was... A lot of fun, and no, I didn't have orgies. I, I didn't see that happening. It wasn't. I didn't do those groups, or else I just missed it. <laughs> that wasn't my thing, you know. I wasn't interested in that. Uh, and so then, from there, uh, before we move on from Osho, uh, you know, looking back on your whole Osho period, um, what do you make of all the? Rolls Royces and the laughing gas addiction and the Howard Hughes like phobias and and all that stuff that he's reputed to have had. I mean, do you see it as just sort of a man who kind of got got older and even as enlightened as he may have been, got a little wacky as he got older? Or do um, you have I don't someone? really care. Uh-huh. You just <laughs> benefited really from it. I don't even care because um, the Rolls Royces were fun. Who cares? It's cars. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was an investment. He didn't own them. They were owned by the community. They were in, in a so-called investment, whether they were a good one or not. It was just fun and, yeah, wacky. Um, I, you know, I read um, also uh, after the, uh, what is it, after the... After the ecstasy, the, the laundry, laundry or some such thing. Jack Cornfield. Yeah, after the ecstasy, the laundry. Um, these people, they're, he was as awake as anybody can be, and he was human. Mm-hmm. This is the thing, you know, if I eat too much sugar, I go off, you know, it's like I have to watch out. Um, uh, and the laughing gas, he, 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 you know, he was having work done in his teeth and he liked it, so I don't know. That, that is the part that I don't, uh, I don't know about. I wasn't there. I know him, you know, from his speaking and he would say a lot of contradictory things, and what I love about that is he would say one thing that was absolutely true and another thing that was absolutely true, like you've said, I've heard you mm-hmm. say, and I, that's my understanding now. They're both true. You yeah. don't have even, to, even though they can contradict yeah, one another. Yeah. yeah. And and I could see then what he was giving me was not a black and white, but a roundness. You know, I could see I got so much from him. Mm-hmm. He was really my master. I've never had another master. I've had a lot of teachers, and and I and still have a lot of teachers. But um, he was incredible. Yeah, and he, you know, um, I don't know about the laughing gas. Somebody sent me a friend. Morgan sent me this thing, and I'm like a, a book on it, and I read it, and I was like, well, it's kind of fun. It just didn't seem like that big of a deal. He yeah. wasn't killing anybody. He wasn't raping children. You know, he wasn't. Right. And I and I have had that in my life and, and around me, and I know that that happens. So terrible things happen. But he didn't do anything, you know, that I would ever consider terrible. He was uh, amazing. The way I've come to terms with it, actually I haven't completely, but, yeah. you know, not only him, but uh, so many gurus was, yeah. and, and so many stories, and, and, you know, which seems to have some substance to them, yeah. is, you know, first of all, take what you need and leave the rest. Exactly. And secondly, you know, don't try to idealize people to the highest heaven, you know. You've got to realize that, you know, we've all got our warts. <laughs> and, yeah, um, and what is your ideal? I mean, maybe 
That's your opinion. Could be a very human how it ought to judgment, be. yeah. Whether he's, he's doing laughing gas, what, how does that affect me? Why do I care? It's, he's not hurting somebody. I mean, I, you know, I think it's a little weird, yeah. You know, I could say, I don't want to do it. <clears throat> but, uh, I, yeah, I think we judge. You know, who mm-hmm. are we to judge? You don't know what's going on in, inside of somebody. So that, I think this judgment thing, one of the things about what happens after awakening is, uh, you know, a decreased ability to judge others. Mm-hmm. A decreased ability. You can't even do it so much. So, I mean, I just don't go there so much. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if there's something that really doesn't feel right to you and you're with a teacher, leave. Yeah. You know? and, and another thing that you know, I find helpful is just to sort of realize that a lot of these Indian teachers are, were raised in a certain cultural context and may not have kind of had the, um, you know... It, may not have ever completely adjusted to the West when they came there and, and to understand the, the cultural differences and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and perhaps had, had actually been able to retain blind spots or, you know, uh, shadow stuff in their Indian culture, which didn't come to light until they were transported to a Western culture. Mm-hmm. And then these things kind of tripped them up a little bit. But, you know, which is, not, again, not to say that they didn't make a tremendous contribution and an impact on people's lives. It's just that, you know, because it's worth considering these things because a lot of people, when that kind of stuff comes to light, they just wash their hands of the whole thing. Yeah. And yeah. That, that's sort of too extreme for my taste. It's, it's more like, again, take what you need and leave the rest and appreciate the good in it. Um, exactly. Yeah. Th- these are human beings. Exactly. And I think that's a great thing about my book. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the ordinary Buddha. Right. You know, you're as much a Buddha as anybody else. And this is where I agree with Trip on that. And yet there's so much more. And I don't put me in a category with, uh, you know, Ramana Maharshi or something. But, mm-hmm. but still, <clears throat> his understanding, when I read what he says, that's my understanding fully. You know, I don't have any argument. I don't have any wonder at what he says. I don't, I don't, right. it's like, yeah, that's what we know. And if you had had the opportunity to to live with Ramana Maharshi day and night and observe oh. observe everything he did, yeah. I mean that might have been. I would have done it. I'm sure it would have <laughs> been marvelous. One. But yeah. even then, you might have said there might have been certain things where you yeah. said, "Yeah, I don't agree with that." You know, I think right, he's exactly. he's he shouldn't enter into that area. He doesn't know anything about it. Yeah. Uh, you know, because sure. I mean, being enlightened doesn't necessarily mean you're going to know all everything about everything. It doesn't make you smarter. I've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, don't know I, about I didn't that. get smarter. Maybe a little wiser. Mm-hmm. But I don't think I'm book learning smarter. But uh, then, so there was Osho, and he was wonderful for me, and very controversial. And people have so much to say about it. And and uh, I lived there, and I, you know, lived on the ranch for three and a half months at one point, and it was just pure love. And yet there was Sheila, and stuff was going on with her that I could see. She's going off. Right. I could see she was losing it um, in my experience with her, literal experience. But Osho stopped one day, just a little story, uh, to my beautiful daughter was there. She was four years old at the time, and he stopped to give her something. He would stop for the children. He was beautiful, and and he didn't have any more candy, couldn't find anything in the car, so didn't uh, didn't have anything for her that day. And so we had to, so a couple of days later, they called me, and, and we had to meet at a certain place, and he tried to give her a bottle of wine because he still had no candy. <laughs> you know what's interesting? Um, well, that's a, I won't go there. But anyway, she said, no, kids don't drink. So he gave it to me. But what was interesting about this whole human thing was he had his hand on the dashboard. I gave him a little gift somebody had given me, a little little shoes that walked, and he put it on his dashboard. It was cute and all that. It was a sweet, very sweet moment because you didn't get to be close to him, you know. So that was wonderful. But um, he had his hand on the da- on the window, you know, and and it was a little brown hand. Now when we see him, he's up on a stage, and now he's just in a big screen, so he looks like a big guru in white or whatever gold he's wearing and the amazing stuff. I have other stories. I have a lot of stories about him, but uh, of ways I saw him that I shouldn't have seen him. That w- connections, but um, that little brown hand blew my mind. I thought, oh no, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh no! It's like finding out your parents have sex, and you're you know you're you're 15 years old or 12 or something. Yeah. And it just blew my mind. I I wanted to leave the ranch. Wow. I thought this is ridiculous. He's mm-hmm. just a man. 
Huh, interesting. You know, and then I did uh, one of his meditations, dynamic meditation, and I just, uh, that just blew away, and I knew it's, it's mm. just an I- my idea of how I thought he ought to be more special, yeah. not have a small brown hand. <laughs> you know? Well, there's a certain uh, showmanship around such people, yeah, too, that almost, you know, it almost intentionally um, conveys yeah. that impression of specialness and big. You know what? And, it got me there. Yeah. You know what really got me there? The book saying you've missed and I didn't want to miss because I've missed with Jesus. I really felt that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and his eyes. It wasn't the showmanship. It was his eyes. I thought, what's going on there? I never knew what enlightenment was. I didn't, wasn't even curious about it. I was l- looking for God. You know, like I said, I was a seeker, but I didn't know what enlightenment was, that you could have something here mm-hmm. in this life. And I saw his eyes, and I said, "What's something's cooking there. Yeah. And, and I've seen that with other gurus, too. Like there's a woman, forget her name, but a beautiful woman with the same eyes. I saw a photograph and I went, oh, she has Osho eyes. This is before I had my own, you know, thing. Mm-hmm. But there's something, there's something more there. So all of this stuff about cars and yeah. all of this stuff, it's something else. It's way deeper. And who cares yeah. about the outside, you know? That's why, t- that's why in my book, and I say, it's not some guy with a beard and a white robe. It's you. It's the little guy down the corner. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't even know. I mean, it's, it's, it's ordinary. I'll tell you a little story. Um, my mother uh, tried to commit suicide three times, and she was in and out of mental hospitals for most of my adolescence. And so when I learned to meditate and all when I was 18, I was really keen on getting her to learn so that she would come out of all that. And um, I was not too successful. I was very heavy-handed about it. But yeah. um, finally, at one point, I was over in Switzerland with Marishi, and um she, unbeknownst to me, had learned to meditate. Uh, had, had, she had already learned, but she had started doing it on her own and had undergone this big transformation. And then she got in touch with me and said, I'd like to come to Switzerland. So she came over. I asked Marcia. He said, yeah, she can come. And so the first night when she got there, he, he walked into the hall. And from a distance, um, she saw him coming down this line of people. And she said, he's so small. <laughs> he's, only yes. about, he's only about five feet tall. And, and then he, he got up to us. And you know she handed him a flower. And he handed her a flower and he, he told me to you know, keep her happy and then he moved on and she turned to me and her face was like flushed and she looked at me and she said he looks right into your soul <laughs> so your, your story good. reminded me of that oh, how and good. she stayed there for nine months and really went underwent a lot of transformation oh hallelujah <laughs> really yeah. you know, that's what I was wishing for when I had my like come down from my, my high mm. initially hoping for that for my family mm. But I had to come down from that high. So, um, yeah, so then there's Osho, and then he passed away, and uh, I wound up with Papaji. But, but my, my uh, awakening experience was standing in the room of my little house. Osho was gone. Um, I wasn't with anybody. <clears throat> I don't think I had been. I hadn't seen Papaji yet because that was after. And I was in this little, I had this little tiny house by the beach in Encinitas, and I was in the middle of my living room, and I said, um, I'm sick of this. I'm, uh, I was demanding. And they say, you know, surrender, but I was uh, aggressive. Hmm. And I was saying, tell me now, what is reality? It wasn't even give me God, give me peace, truth. What's, rea- what's real? And literally, I didn't know if real was anything good or if it was going to be horrible. I didn't know if I was going to die and I was absolutely willing. I just had to know what was real. I couldn't stand it anymore. 20 years. Gangaji was coming the next day and I said, I'm just sick of this. And I'd never met her before. But um, I... Uh, it's it's, uh, it's kind of big, you know. But it was like, kill me right now or tell me the truth. You know, and I didn't say kill me, but kill my life. Everything yep. in my life that I have, you can take it all away. Everything. And and uh, I have to know what's real. I'm not going to move. And literally, and I knew, I wasn't going to move my foot until I knew. And then it was just right there. And and uh, because I, because I, you know, <laughs> looking back, it's like I didn't know why, what, but I had surrendered, you know, mm-hmm. everything that I thought I was. So what's left is who you really are. When you take the, everything you thought you were and you just are willing to let that disappear, um, the real is just there. And I saw it as a Buddha right here. It was right here. It was a, a, a little Buddha, and it told me everything. 
Interesting, it wasn't a female. It was, you know, a Buddha, <laughs> like we all look at the male. So you actually had a little visual. I had uh, a visual because I'm a, I'm a visual. These are my paintings behind me. That oh, nice. Yeah. I do. I did since I had more, my creativity opened up. I didn't mm-hmm. do that before. But um, it was a visual. It was a Buddha, and it was total peace, mm-hmm. you know, total um, presence, um, you know, like nobody home who wanted anything else then, you know, than what was. But with that came, like Adi Ashanti said, downloads, you know. And I had mentioned before then I knew that you were also that. And I, and I would call it that to me, to myself. I'm that. Oh, I'm that. You know, that's what I got. <gasps> I'm that. I'm not this. And my, my personality literally just kind of went boom. You know, I could see it and it just went to the side. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> that was my big one because um, it was something I wanted for all these years since I was a kid. And, and this was me. I could cry right now. You can cry but, if you want. Okay. <laughs> It'll be better. <laughs> but I do. I cry easy. I cry really easy. My daughter just told me a story about something, and I just, I didn't even know the person, and I'm all ready to burst into tears. But mm. <clears throat> Maybe you can become Speaker of the House, you know. We'll get, oh, rid, of, yeah. get rid of John <laughs> Boehner. And <laughs> I'm a crier. I love that he does that. Uh, but... Um, <laughs> We would be interesting speakers of the house, I'll tell you, one of us. Yeah. But so all the downloads of, of everything, that that is true. I mean, I can't even tell you. But love, you know, is the primary thing. I literally thought if, it is, if it's a monster, if it's an ugly, horrible monster and it's going to eat me up, because I used to be afraid to meditate because I was afraid things would come in. Mm. And so I forced myself to sit on a rug in my living room when I was married still and uh, just sit there. Don't meditate. And then I, I was afraid. Hmm. You know, the ego is terrified because hmm. it is going to get eaten up. <laughs> That's what happens. Actually, now they think about it. But uh, it wasn't a monster. It was this, this pure um, uh, peace. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was the first experience. And then... Um, just, then uh, I, just on it, this fear thing of the ego getting eaten up, uh, the one observation I've noted is that, you know, some people, it's like just nibbled at, you know, and it just sort of gets nibbled away to nothing rather gradually and there's never any big drama. Others, it's so abrupt and sudden that, that yeah. they're just abjectly terrified and, yeah. you know, so it can be different for different folks like that's that. That's why I love my book and that's why, well, that's why I was compelled to, compelled to, to do these interviews and write this. I was compelled because I was so fascinated about all the different ways and, and like my friend Denise, uh, who's in the book, she Hers was very gradual, very soft. She'd had, th- she'd had experiences as a child, mm-hmm. which isn't in the book though, which is interesting. She's had, she had a near death thing and out of the body thing and, you know, so this kind of led up. <clears throat> but they're so completely different and some of them say, you can't go demanding, but that's what I did. Mm-hmm. So that's why I thought, but it's interesting. So anyway, that was that. And so I was able, able to move my foot <laughs> because I found it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a celebration, you know. I was like, "Oh my God, you know, here it is." I just this thing I've been looking for. Um, and then, and then, I, I, you know, as I'm saying that, I'm thinking of Troy in my book, and he says, "This thing I've been looking for for eons, and there you are." Mm-hmm. I looked in the mirror and I looked in my eyes, and there you are, <laughs> all the time, God. So, so these things that I'll have something and it triggers, you know, we've all had. Um, but then the thing with Jeff, which I told you, you know, just lying in bed at night and um, seeing this energy, because I had said, why am I having these psychic experiences? I was having these experiences, having dreams that were telling me things that I shouldn't know, but they would be absolutely true. And, uh, and I asked a friend of mine, uh, Dean, actually, very wise man, what's going on? He said, but I was uh, actually having meditations in my home at that time. And he said, well, you're just giving out so much energy that it's coming back. And I'm saying this to Jeff, that's what, what triggered it, saying Dean says, I'm just giving out this. And then all of a sudden I saw the energy, you know, moving through my body, and that's all there was. And then the personality was literally seen to not, um, didn't exist. So anyway, those are my, those are my main things. And then the deepening, you know, which just, then I went to see Papaji. And the interesting thing about the no breath of difference that, that Tripp says, when I went to, was getting ready to go see Papaji, um, 
uh, with my friend Yudhishthira and stuff. But um, I knew that if he didn't recognize me, then he wasn't the real deal. Mm -hmm. I just knew it. Because the knowing is there. It's not even an understanding. It's not intellectual. You know it. Like, this is a table. I mean, that's, you know, more than that. And, uh, and of, of course, he did recognize it. And he said something to me, too, which is interesting. So when I met Papaji, that was a whole, I'm going to write a book on all my teachers because it's so much fun. And there, I have a lot of little stuff about them. But um, when, he, when I talked with him, I spoke with him in, in, the, in the main group, and he said, oh, you know your own beauty. Hmm. And I said, oh, oh, I didn't know that, but yeah, that's what it is. Hmm. I didn't know. I didn't have those words for it. I knew I was that. I was Buddha. You know. Well, that's what he meant. Yes, that's yeah, what he meant. It's just but his way of saying that it. That word, you know, was another facet. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know my own beauty, because I mean, I don't think I had that at growing up. <laughs> you know, I didn't yeah. have. I was kind of a person who wasn't a child who wasn't very confident, who was, you know, uh, you know, had inferiority complex. I labeled myself at fourteen. You know. And so to know my own beauty was another beautiful, you know, aspect that that uh, other people have said. And I said, yeah, that's what he said to me, you know. So, and that's, and then it just goes on and on from there. Nice. <clears throat> so those are really the main chapters, huh? The, so, the, yeah. the, the Osho chapter, the Catholic chapter, the Osho chapter, the Awakening chapter, and then it just goes on and on from there. And then writing the book. And writing the book, yeah. And, and that's been my meditation for all these years. Um, you is know, the book a work in progress? I mean, do you continue to no. re revise it? And this one is done. <laughs> okay. No, it's done. Mm -hmm. um, it, it says everything that I ever wanted to say in there as far as that. Yeah. I have, that really, I, I'm writing one on um, uh, Nobody in India, Walking the Inner Path, mm -hmm. which is about being in uh, Arunachala mm -hmm. and, um, you know... <laughs> Sitting in front in Arunachala, sitting in front of uh, in Ramana's ashram, in front of the big wall that has his awakening experience, I would just sit there and I would start to read it, and I would go boom. Hmm. I couldn't read anymore, and I would like drag myself back and hmm. read it, go boom. <laughs> you know, so it's still, even though I have those experiences, it's something else kept coming in. So, and then, like you said, what is the, my conclusion now? So now the conclusion is. There is no one way. I can't tell somebody how to get away. Don't do it my way unless that's where you're compelled. You know, you can't follow Troy, who, who was a, a drug addict, alcoholic. Mm -hmm. um, that was his way. Don't maybe do that or unless you feel like that. You know, he, his, his was spontaneous and Byron Katie's was spontaneous out of, out of nothing, you know, out of not knowing the word enlightenment. He didn't know what meditation was, Troy. And I love that. I lo you got to read that part in the book. If you haven't, you guys out there, read Troy, because it was his inner voice that said, sit down. And so he sat. He said, so I sat. And then it said, breathe. Hmm. So I breathed. And then I noticed that there was some nervousness in the breath. So then he worked at calming his breath. And he was, you know, moving into meditation, moving into yoga, and he didn't know it. Now he's like a... a fabulous yoga teacher in Encinitas. He's just a beautiful guy. And coming from nothing. And here I was a seeker for 20 years, and I was like, I'm sick of this. I'm going to find out. And they say, that's not the way. You can't go for it. You know. But so, you can go for it. You did go for I it. I did. Yeah. So, so there's no one way. There's no right. There's no wrong. And, and so I think that's, uh, I think that's my mission is to just, you know, if I have one, is to just say, live your life fully. And do, you know, follow that voice that Byron Katie talks about and um, go where you're compelled to go. And, mm -hmm. and, you, and, if, and then I also heard somebody say, maybe on one of your interviews because I've been watching them, um, if you have an open heart and you're interested, you want to know what truth is. You want to wake up or you want to know reality like was my word for it. Whatever it is, if you want that and you have an open heart, just follow your life and, mm -hmm. and move into it. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I share, again, as you said in the beginning, we concur on things pretty yeah. seamlessly. Um, That's why uh, when, I, when I first saw your site, Mm -hmm. uh, that you were doing this, I went, oh my God, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. And I didn't know anybody else who was doing that from an ordinary perspective. Mm -hmm. I, 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 a beautiful book is, and I wish I knew the title, 
which I don't, but it's a, a book about people who followed out, uh, followed Papaji. Mm -hmm. That's another beautiful book about kind of ordinary people, but it's still based on a master. Yeah. It's based on one way to go. Mine is like there's no one way to go. And I, I hear you say, so anyway, I, I saw what you were doing, and, I, and then, then I started watching, and I went, well, you really, we're kind of, you know, it's accepting. It's acceptance of so many things that look contradictory. And like I said, I kind of learned that from Osho early on, but... Um, it's not non-dual. It's not dual. It's just not. You can't put a yeah. label. You can't put a. You know. In, you know. I, when I read, uh, uh, John Troy was having this group, and it was a non-dual group, and I started reading what people were saying. Went, oh, those are my people. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't coming from that background, and so I went and I met them, and uh, you know, went to some of their things, which I adore, and they're wonderful people. But I can't put a box around it. You know. Right. And and I and uh, then they get into all these philosophical things, and it's uh, it's just big, <laughs> bigger, bigger. Can't bring it down to that. There's a you may have noticed on my Skype uh, little Skype identity, it says whatever you think, it's more than that. And there you go. That's a quote <laughs> from the Incredible String Band. But um, there's uh, just yesterday I posted by the latest interview that I posted, which is with the guy who has been very involved with ayahuasca and even had a profound awakening when he took ecstasy. And, you know, I kind of uh, had a pretty strong anti-drug bias over the years, yeah. having, having indulged in them in the 60s and then kind of spent a long time repairing the damage they did, despite the fact that they opened me up to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, now I'm kind of... I find it hard to judge, like you say. It's like this this guy was very intelligent, creative, and um, you know, although I would approach such things with a cautionary note, and you know, and things can be done recklessly and frivolously without proper seriousness, and be, and get yeah. one get one into trouble. Who am I to say that that's not um, exactly what he should be doing, uh, and that it's not producing, you know, very genuine evolutionary influence for him, which apparently it is. Um, it's so, what I say. It's the way that he's compelled to go. Yeah, yeah. He has to follow that. He can't follow your way of not doing drugs. It won't work for him. And will he be doing that 20 years from now? Who knows? You know, Probably maybe not. Maybe I'll be doing ayahuasca 20 years from now <laughs> <laughs> if I'm still around. Well, uh, Olaf in my book uh, yeah. did ayahuasca, and he right. called it the death drug. Mm -hmm. They call it the death vine, and and because if you don't use it right, that's It'll what kill you end up. And and he did it in a ritualistic context with. Um, with um, shamans in, in uh, South America. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was one way for him. Yeah. yeah I don't argue with it. <laughs> I don't argue with God. One Maybe. thing I want to suggest to, to kind of zoom out again, I like, I like to play cosmic zoom lens in my Good. mind. I'm always kind of zooming out to the kind of galactic level and zooming down to the Planck scale. And it's just in my imagination, but it, it helps me to kind of keep things in perspective. That's truth. Yeah. That's I mean, what it is. Both of those perspectives it's, it's, are, are It's as big as the universe. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a, a little poem called this. It's that. It's mm -hmm. that. And it's this. It's the cell on the tip of my nose. It's that intimate. Yep. So I like that. Here's That's another perfect. Sanskrit phrase for, for you. It goes, Ano Raniyan Mahato Mahiyan, which means smaller than the smallest, bigger than the biggest. You know what I love to interrupt you and we'll get back, but. Mm -hmm. uh, that the things that you say, the Sanskrit mm -hmm. phrases that are from eons, are my experience, mm -hmm. my direct experience. And when I hear that, that's why I know when somebody says something, I recognize that they're there because they they go, oh yeah, you know, and and that you're telling me stuff I already knew in a more beautiful way. I love hearing, hearing all of that. Great, yeah, I do too. And I, you know, I'm pretty much a truth is just truth. Whether it yeah. is from eons ago or it's from today. Yeah. Truth is only one. And there are people who are much more qualified to do this kind of thing than, than I am. I mean, yeah. there are people, I have friends who are like encyclopedias of this kind of stuff <laughs> and who, who could really c come out with all kinds of gems, but I'm I just. I think you do really, really, really well. I'm doing my best. One thought I've been having lately, I wanted to bounce it off you and see what kind of discussion it stimulates. I've been sort of thinking that this is kind of abstract, but it's like, Oneness needs duality in order to know itself. Does that make sense? And and yes. in a and in a different because if it were just oneness, then it wouldn't. Who would know what? And and there's a different. There's another flavor to that, which is that 
it seems, that, and I've heard this said, I'm not making this up, um, that, you know, pure existence has a self-referral quality inherent in it, such that it, you know, it kind of looks at itself, and in, and in, and in that process, in, you Say know, that again. it's pure like existence. pure existence has a self-referral quality inherent in it, and it, and, and it knows itself by that quality, and in doing so, immediately, uh, the 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 knower, the process of knowing, and the known are set up. In in Sanskrit, they actually call this Rishi Devata and Chandras. There's this sort of diversification that takes place by virtue of that self-referral quality, and that you know then the whole you know bifurcation and diversification continues, and we end up with the universe. But um, but we we have the the kind of the that that is contained within our nature as well. We have the seeds of that in in mm. in our makeup, and that's why we go th- at a certain point. There's this yearning to to wake up. You know, we we are the the uh, you know we are oneness having diversified so that it could you know eventually know itself in, as a living reality. Um, as a breathing, loving, eating, living <laughs> reality, yeah. uh, which which ends up being more mm-hmm. than mm-hmm. just flat oneness without any sort of um, diversification. It, it's somehow the whole become becomes more than the sum of its parts. Uh, you know, Brahman is sometimes referred to that way, and um, as being more than the sum of all the parts. So anyway, that's just kind of something I've been toying with lately, and I just wanted to see what you thought of that and any kind of insights you yeah. might have or anything. Uh, you know, it's like um, what I've heard people say. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> what he said. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, so I, I think that um, that's the whole point. And, you know, when you, when you talked about it, it's like, <clears throat> what is this longing? You know, what is this intense longing like? Just kill me or tell me truth. You know, I have to know what it is. And, and, and what you know is, oh, I'm God. I'm that, you know, huge thing, but it, I'm in here. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, that's what I hear people say, and that sounds right to me. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, and it feels, you know, it, it's what is this longing to know itself? That's, yeah. That's what it is. Why? Why else are we here? I mean, that's I think the whole point, and and yet it's probably more than that because it, it's also to live, uh, like you say, bifurcated. You know, it's like to create a lot of different stuff here. Mm-hmm. You know, we're creators, and like you were saying before, well, if God's creator of all of that and the cells and then the birds and the beauty, then and we're part of God, so then we're here to to create. That's that's what I think we really are here for. Mm-hmm. Um, to discover ourselves and to create out of that, and, and you know, almost all poetry and um, paintings, the the really best stuff is is what's describing that experience. Mm. So if that's what you're saying, but yeah, I, th- I think it is. It's it's just something I find myself pondering a lot, and I've heard it discussed before by much people much more articulate than I. But I'm just coming to own it more and, yeah. and kind of chewing on it, you know. Yeah, but the piece that really hits me is is that longing for God to know itself. Mm. It's that longing for the immensity to, to know itself as all the diversity and, and, and this one, you know. And this one is unique and, and is uh, real, you know, I mean, on the planet. I mean, I'm here and you're there. And we, the, the other exciting thing is, you know, there's the oneness that we know we're all ocean. But then um, the, the diversity of each individual is how does that happen? Mm. That there is nobody like you, there's nobody like me exactly, and you know, even if somebody looks a little like you or a lot like you, it's not you. It can't be. So how, to me, that's as much a miracle as the oneness. Yeah. The diversity of each individual, that you're unique, so play it, you know, do it as best you can, and mm. you know, we're here to, yeah, to, to create. And when I'm happy is when I'm creating. Mm-hmm. And that's why I like doing hair. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I'm I'm making people beautiful. I'm I'm literally making them as pretty as they can be, or you know, good looking sure. if it's a man. Mm-hmm. But uh, I love that. It's like creating the paintings 
uh, on people. It's That's great. creation. And if I didn't have that, I'd have to do something else that was cre- I would be painting more. Mm. I find that too. I used to like, you know, go hiking on vacations and I'd find myself writing books in my mind. I had to do yeah. something creative. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or drawing a leaf or, you know. Yeah. Yes. But that thing you said about longing, I think everything in creation is imbued with that longing. Rocks, stars, frogs, every everything has that sort of, we could call it force of evolution um, permeating them and uh, kind of moving them along in the direction of fuller and fuller uh, manifestation or, or ref- uh, embodiment of source of being of, of yeah. pure consciousness and, and it's fascinating to th- could ponder that even I mean our bodies are made of stardust as you know jo- Joni Mitchell sang um, you know we're stardust we're 14 billion year old carbon I just put that on Facebook oh cool we are stardust we are golden and we have to get back to the garden right I exactly said, I said oh yeah we are here <laughs> uh-huh. oh, yeah we're already in the garden and so think of that process and think of the patience uh, as, well, it's that, that intelligence doing it all is beyond time anyway, so I guess patience doesn't come into it. But there had to be stars. Mm-hmm. And how long did it take for stars to form and then to, to live out their lives and to explode and to form, to scatter heavy elements throughout the universe that could eventually become bodies that could eventually evolve to the point where they could know that garden, you know, know that essence uh, as themselves. Uh, so it's, it's this marvelous, movie. yeah, this whole Gorgeous. marvelous dance that's that's going on. It's just fascinating. Mm, 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 mm. And then the other thing, that's that painting. It's like light, you know, <clears throat> for me. It's that everything is is coming out of this like star. That's like a star, like a like a mm, like a supernova. Yeah, mm-hmm. but you know, the thing about animals, that everything evolving. This is another like woo woo thing that that I. I was talking to this lady about yesterday, but <clears throat> about being inside of animals' heads mm-hmm. and knowing mm-hmm. what they were thinking. Mm. So I've had that too. It's one and of the Yoga Sutras. It's one of the cities of Patanjali. Is yeah, know, yeah, knowing the minds. Know this stuff. Yeah, knowing the minds of all beings, and uh, you know, and yeah. I've had several friends who told me that they were, you know, all of a sudden, you know, picking up on the thoughts of a squirrel or something like yeah, that. That's yeah, that's exactly. I, I had uh, it was my dog that I had before. Mm-hmm in California and he was a standard poodle and he was about nine months old and or maybe a little younger but he was pretty big mm-hmm. but he was still a puppy and I was on the leash behind him on the sidewalk and I was talking to him and he wasn't paying any, any attention to me and all of a sudden I was in his head mm. and I was experiencing his thoughts or his um, awareness and because it wasn't like thoughts but it was like wow so much going on here! Yeah. <laughs> wow! <laughs> you know, it was like the trees, the birds, the cars. You know, me talking behind him, uh-huh. and so and visual. You know, there was so much to see and to hear, and, and the smell, the light and the smells, and yeah I, yeah, I didn't tune in on smells now that I think about it, but but the visual and the sound and everything. But it was so much, mm-hmm. and he was just on the corner, just wow. And I'm trying to talk to him. He's like, yeah, whatever. He doesn't hear me at all. <laughs> so, so it was really, I was in there. And, and so I came, and then I got it. I went, mm-hmm. oh, I get it. So I, then I came in front of him, and I went, Elvis, which is his name, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we need to wait here, or whatever I needed to say, and then we're going to cross the street. You know, and he's like, oh, okay. And then <laughs> I knew, and I wasn't in his head anymore, but I knew he was, I could get how mm. to talk to a dog, you know, get down to his level. Because he didn't differentiate me from anything else. He didn't have that ability at that age. Mm. So then, and I, and I have a dog now that's amazing, and, and it's like watching her become human, you know, just get it. I mean, I say, I'm sorry, we can't, I can't take you today. So she backs up and sits down. I don't say sit, stay. Right. I'm sorry. She's like, oh, yeah, all right, whatever. So she sits down. You know, she backs up two inches and sits down. It's so funny. <laughs> they're so wise and they are growing and they grow with us you know mm-hmm. and then I had a cockroach I put that on Facebook too <laughs> oh, you, you had your own cockroach I had a cockroach mm-hmm. I was I was literally sitting on the john in California and this little cockroach ran across the wall and I just got I just got him hmm. I just got it he just wants to live <laughs> yeah he wants to live exactly he just wants to live 
life. He wants to be alive and find some food and some safety. Mm -hmm. It was like I was, but I, you know, it was a, a smaller awareness than the dog. So now that you talk about evolving, now that I, I didn't think about that before, but it was like a smaller awareness, and yet it was very full. I mean, it was really like, it was as big as me wanting to live in. Eat sure. It's the earth. same impulse. It was. Same impulse in the, and same consciousness. It's the same consciousness in the cockroaches in you and I. It's just a different reflector, you know. So I think I told you all my woo-woo stuff. I think, <laughs> I think I'm Well, good. you'll have you'll have to cook up some more. I uh, some will, will be happening. Yeah. But it, it's so true. I mean, and it's the complexity of the nervous system that enables it to be more, that, that really characterizes what we mean by evolution. I mean, a human nervous system is so much more complex than a cockroach. Mm -hmm. And the brain is so much more complex and so on. And it's just that, that more sophisticated instrument is just capable of embodying uh, divine intelligence so much more fully. And and who who knows? I mean, you know, we might be cockroaches by comparison with some nervous systems that are out there in the really? universe. <laughs> That's uh, you know, in terms yeah. of what they can know and and do and be. I think what that gave me, you know, was, uh, um, you know, a res more of a respect for life. You know, yeah. a kind of life. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Cool. Well, we're sort of reaching that magic moment, I suppose, when you know we can begin to think about wrapping it up. Um, you know, I mean, it's, this is the kind of thing where we could just get cups of coffee and sit around all day and <laughs> I know it, I know keep it. keep shooting the breeze. It's, but, it's uh, so much fun. I, I, you know, there's a, a Suzanne Marie who I'm book, uh, Facebook friends with. Mm -hmm. You might be finding her. I, I recommend you interview her. Uh, I don't even remember her background, but we went and met for coffee after meeting on Facebook and like, whoa, who are you? You know, because we were right in the same mm -hmm. alignment and she's just beautiful. But it was two hours, two and a half hours over coffee and then like, now maybe I should go now, you know, but yeah. we should go on for, uh, because, you know, this is the most exciting thing there is mm -hmm. to talk about is your own reality, you know, the essence of, of who you are. So I do want to say, like I had <clears throat> said during our little break, I, uh, my book is an e-book. It's, it's available through Barnes and Noble and, uh, Amazon. Uh, Amazon on Kindle and whatever. <clears throat> it's, I think mostly Amazon is where it's really being sold, but mm -hmm. I am looking for a hardcover publisher. Uh, publisher mm -hmm. So I would love to have that happen. And I have like three other books. One is almost done and others spinning around here that I would love to get done, but I, I think that getting a publisher for this one is going to, uh, you know, encourage me to finish the, the other. Good. Yeah, so if any hardcover publishers are listening to this yeah. interview, get, get get in touch. Yeah. Um, and uh, also I'll be linking to your book on Face uh, on on Bat Gap on Buddha at the oh. Gas Pump. So right dr right directly to the Amazon page where it can be bought. Um, so people can 499 such a deal such a deal um, so people can follow that link and and I also wanted to say you know uh, just unrelated to this interview but I, I get um, requests and recommendations every day new several a day for various people to interview and I always say okay we'll put you on the list but I'm only doing one a week and I don't know when we're going to be able to schedule it um, so I really apologize to people who have you know, sent in recommendations or, or requests, and I haven't gotten to them yet. I'm hoping to gradually get to the point where I can do even more of these, you know, more than once a week, as my as this becomes more my day job than my day job is. Um, mm. There's hopefully signs of that. What do and you do for a day job? I do search engine optimization, bringing more traffic to people's websites. Ah, that's okay. what that is. I could use you. Yeah. So, <laughs> do you need well, a haircut? No. Uh, well, I'd have to come to North Carolina to get it. I think. <laughs> no, that's what I do. My my, I, searchsummit dot com is my business website, and so I spend most of my time doing that. And this is you know part time thing, obviously. But this um, is such a gift to 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 everybody who sees it. It's, I I just love your show, and uh, I get a lot from you know. I'm up in the middle of the night, you know two hours interviews, you know, and I'm like, it's, it, I woke up at three and now I'm up till five because I have to hear the ending and wow. I, I'm uh, really enjoying them. Well, yeah. that's, that's great. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, you can also get it on, if you have an iPod 
uh, you can get it on that as a podcast and, and just, you know, go take a walk in the woods and listen to it or something so you don't have to sit in front of your computer. I need um, to get hooked up. <laughs> yeah. Have your, have your daughter. My daughter will help me. Yeah, you know, one of those people. It's yeah. very handy. I mean, I spend yeah. at least an hour a day, you know, I'll go out this afternoon and cross country skiing and I'll be listening to something yeah. as I'm going through the woods. <clears throat> um, so let me make some wrap-up points. So I've been speaking with Anita Campbell. Hopefully I pronounced that right, uh, Ta Campbell. And she lives in Asheville, as you've gleaned from this interview. Has Actually, written a, near Asheville. Near Hendersonville, Asheville. right. I live in the woods. Beautiful. Um, I once spent five weeks meditating in a cabin down there in Boone, North Carolina. Um, nice area. <laughs> and I, was, we were, I was with some friends. We were high as a kite after five weeks of meditating. We went out for this 4th of July kind of thing at this place called the Houndeers Lodging Club and we felt like we were from outer space. We felt like totally like space aliens and all these people said, hi, how are you? <laughs> 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 oh boy. Um, in any case. They're beautiful people here. Yeah. The Ordinary Buddha, Stories of Awakening. Uh, we'll, we'll link to that from my site. And um, if you want to get in touch with Anita, I'll be linking to her website and so on. You can get in touch with her through that, friend her on Facebook or whatever. So this uh, show, as you pr most of you probably know, is an ongoing series, and I do a new one each week. Uh, hopefully, uh, before too long, I'll be able to do more than one a week. We'll see how that goes. And if you'd like to check out the others, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P. You can uh, find, there's an alphabetical list on the right-hand side of the page. If you scroll down a little, you'll see all the, all the interviews available. <clears throat> you can sign up to be notified by email whenever a new one is posted. Uh, Which I just did. Oh, yeah, I noticed that come in. And... Um, then uh, there's also a chat group that springs up around every interview that gets quite lively sometimes, so feel free to participate in that. Um, there, This is also, as we were saying a minute ago, available as a podcast. There's a link to the podcast on every interview, so you can go there and, and uh, subscribe to it. And in case you don't know, the way a podcast works is if you have a, an iPod, um, you, 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 oh, you subscribe to a podcast, and it... it brings it into iTunes, which is a free Apple software that runs on Macs or PCs, and every time a new thing uh, shows up, like when I post this interview, for instance, and you open up iTunes, it automatically downloads, and then as soon as you plug in your iPod, it automatically transfers it to your iPod if you've you know, set it up to do that, and then you can unplug your iPod and listen to it while I do other things, so it's very handy. And um, in case those are unfamiliar with the way podcasting works, that's the way that works. So, I'm kind of getting to the point where I'm getting long-winded. I get energized in these in these interviews, and yes. I, I get it's like coffee. I get really talkative. <laughs> I feel like that way too, like buzzing. Yeah. Uh, at certain points. Good. So, donate button is there. Won't elaborate on that, but the, the implications are clear, and uh, that should just about do it. All right? Anything more? Thank you so much, and uh, thank your wife Irene for emails and you know, support back there because I know she's a good support for you and the, and the other people who are supporting you. So it's just a, just a wonderful show. It's a, such a pleasure to talk with you. Yeah, Irene helps with schedu scheduling these days and I have a friend up in Canada who helps also with keeping track of a lot of things and a very good friend who was my best friend in high school who is actually from the Asheville area, although currently he's living on the coast in South Carolina, who does all the post-production and he's spent mm -hmm. hundreds of hours. His name is Ralph Preston of Snow Hill Video and uh, I'm totally grateful to him for everything he's been doing all these several years. Couldn't have done it without him. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so thanks to everyone. Uh, and thank you, Anata, and thanks to all who have been listening or watching, and we'll see you next week. And I think next week is going to be me, actually. Uh, some guy wanted to interview me. And uh, so in case you haven't heard enough of me talking, you'll have an opportunity to hear more next week. You know what? One more little thing I, I was just remembering. Uh, Yukio Ramana was supposed to be the next week. Brian was the week before me. So mm. I'm, like, uh, bookended by people who... I know, but Yukio Raman is a good friend of mine, and okay. he's coming now down the list a few weeks down. And uh, yes, he is. Yeah, he's he's in my book, and uh, he his his way of going about it was very sort of scientific. So it's just hmm. another completely different avenue, and uh, his uh, talks are wonderful, and 
at the end of his article, uh, is, his story is when I wrote this thing called This, where I just got it in a group with him that I'm just so, it's so intimate as well as so mm. vast. So, cool. Thank you so um, much. Oh, thank you, Ananta. We'll see you later. <laughs>